welcome to School Talk. I'm Nadja Varney, your host. Public education for all of our children is the bedrock of democracy. Bilingual education has been controversial since 1974, when the United States Supreme Court ruled that if children cannot understand English, then they do not have equal access to a quality education. Today, and that is by the way, even if they have the same facilities, the same teachers and books and curriculum. Well today, under the umbrella of bilingual education, we're going to be talking about something relatively new. It's called dual language education. And I'm delighted to have two educators on the ground doing dual education from the Leviton Public School in Providence, Rhode Island. I'm happy to have Mr. Robert Prignano and Ms. Kimberly Gibo. Welcome, fellow teachers. It's, a, it's so good to have to be you here. here. Thank you. You know, so often we're interviewing the people who run the schools or policy makers. So I'm kind of excited today to have the people that really make a difference, the real heroes. Thank you. We're yeah. there right mm -hmm. on the front line. Yeah, that's exactly yep. right. <laughs> well, very briefly, before we get into the topic, how did you get interested? This is very unusual, dual language. Um, how did you get interested in this? Well, for me, I've always had a passion about language. And um, I uh, majored in French, minored in Spanish. And then I found my way into transitional bilingual education, where I taught for many, many years. A position became available at the Providence Public Schools for a dual language coach. I applied for that position, and I got that position. But after about six years of that, I decided I really, really wanted to go back to the classroom where I could bring best dual language practice directly to the students that I had in front of me. But uh, that's pretty much it for Excellent. me. Excellent. Yeah. No, that's wonderful, because I, I had a similar trip where I was um, doing workshops for teachers and then eventually wound up, at the end, back in the first grade teaching it. So uh, I understand. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. how about you, Kimberly? I started teaching in the general ed classroom and the English language learners always fascinated me. They really love challenges and they were great problem solvers. So about six years ago I had the opportunity to interview for the position at Leviton Dual Language and I got the position. So they have someone who loves them there. Yes. <laughs> they found them <laughs> mm -hmm. and they found you. Mm -hmm. Well before we go too far let's be good teachers and define. How, how do you define um, should we say bilingual education and then define dual language uh, well, education? Bilingual ed <coughs> is the umbrella and there are many different programs under the bilingual education. Um, one of them being transitional bilingual education, mm -hmm. also known as TBE, and that's a subtractive program because it takes away, it eventually takes away the child's native language and replaces it with English, whereas dual language is additive and in it, the children maintain, own, and refine their native language and add English to it. Mm -hmm. So they're not losing their language in order to acquire English. Isn't that wonderful, yes. especially in the global economy yes. where we need people who can speak. I'm always amazed that Americans, we just don't want to speak any other language. And all over Europe and you know, South mm -hmm. America, everybody speaks more than one language. And I think it's just wonderful that you're embarking on this. Um, you know, people say, well, we don't know enough about this, we don't want to get involved. Is there any research about dual language education? <clears throat> WIDA. The WIDA, Center for Applied Linguistics. What, that is. what is that? WIDA stands for Wisconsin, Delaware, Arkansas. In 2002, I believe it was, they received, they were the first states to receive a grant to explore this, to explore best practices for second language learners. And uh, they work with dual language, they work with ESL, as well as other bilingual programs. Uh, there's, so there's tons of research under WIDA. There's also great research under the Center for Applied Linguistics. They created a protocol, dual language guidelines mm -hmm. for best <laughs> dual language practice. Was Dr. Nancy Cloud involved in that? She was in a national program at one point. I don't know if she was involved with that, but she was involved at our school when we weren't at the building we are at right mm -hmm. now. Um, because she did speak also about research that showed quite a few positive results uh, from dual language back then, even when mm -hmm. I spoke with her. 
many positive results, mm -hmm. many, yeah. many benefits and for that's the students. What, that's what impressed me because um, people are, you know, nervous about it, about whether, you know, many things that they're questioning. So there is, you feel, a, a research base and it's positive. It's all scientifically based research. Everything we do is based on scientific research. Well, yes. That's good. And now, uh, going from the students and how wonderfully they will keep, hopefully, both of their languages, what about you guys, the teachers? What are your qualifications? Are there special qualifications? There aren't <clears throat> any special qualifications right now, but the state of Rhode Island is starting oh. to acquire teachers to have the dual language uh, certification. Mm -hmm. Oh, they mm -hmm. are starting to. Well, you know, this <clears throat> is not uh, unusual. Um, I interviewed um, people involved with middle school, like NELMS, um, which is all centered around element, uh, middle schools. And there's no certification for middle school either. And they have a very special, uh, they're very special children at that age. Uh, people will say, oh, well, you know, we want K through 12 or 6 through 12 and 1 through 3. But there are other parts in education where people are still passionate, but there's not a true certification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is not unusual uh, for what's happening with you. Well, for the Spanish side teacher, no, I'm the Spanish side teacher in our partnership, so I teach all day in Spanish. You do need a bilingual endorsement. Okay, that's what I kind of thought, that yeah. you would have to have more than just, I speak, um, right. yo hablo espanol un poquito. No, you need to take that's all the me. testing. <laughs> <and> the <laughs> <laughs> because in school, escuela in New York City, when I was just a youngster, but that's about it. My vocabulary <laughs> is limited. So you have to have the bilingual, bilingual certification or endorsement. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think maybe that's been changed to a bilingual certification now, but when I rec uh, received my certification, it was a bilingual endorsement. Um, it's just con connecting now to um, the research, I've read that it seems that um, it indicates to me that the earlier a child starts with bilingual or dual language, the more successful that child would be. Because I know my Spanish is so poor, because all I had was junior high school. There are advantages to both sides of that coin, uh, according to WIDA. Which is um, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Delaware, Delaware Arkansas. And Arkansas. Arkansas, yes. those three states. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. We're the birthplace of education, New England, and we, we had to wait for WIDA, Wisconsin, and other places. <laughs> to um, give us their grant. They had the first grant, yes. was that it? Yes. Yeah. I'm always jealous because I think we're first in everything in Massachusetts. <laughs> the WI of WIDA <coughs> is for Wisconsin. The D is for Delaware yes. and the A is for mm -hmm. Arkansas. But um, they found, it's, that's a really fascinating question because they do say that there are advantages to starting early. There are also advantages to start as uh, an adult or an older learner. An older learner. Um, the advantages for starting early were that the children, I guess because they're speaking the language for over so many years, they end up acquiring a more authentic native-like accent, native speaker accent. The, old, the high school or older child? The early, the early oh, children. Oh, the earlier get yep. that. Yep. And they also oh, have yes. um, long-term benefits in regards to how they use the grammar of the language because they've been using it for so many years because they started out so young, but the advantages for the um, older children? They are able to acquire vocabulary oh. easily because they are exposed to vocabulary. Well, that goes along. I was a reading specialist for most of my career, and we found that students who could read in their own language, they come in in fourth grade or sixth grade, they could catch up so quickly. There you it was go. amazing. Mm -hmm. That's yes. one of the basic foundings of dual language. Yes. That the stronger they get in their own language. The quicker and they our, learn English. Right, that's right. Yeah, it, it just amazed me. Learn. I thought they were all brilliant, but mm -hmm. there's, you know, the whole process of reading. They understand the process of the, reading yep. so they can transfer it to some. And, where right. a little child yes. has no idea of, you know, letters bouncing around yeah. except on Sesame Street or someplace. But in actual, you know, it, learning. It goes back to reading is reading. <clears throat> yes. The language doesn't matter. Isn't that amazing when you think about it? You can be doing it in Chinese, uh, Spanish, mm -hmm. English. Mm -hmm. uh, what a brain, amazing the brain. 
But that's another whole show. We've had people on to talk about that. <laughs> you can come back and join us if you like. <laughs> well, you did mention the brain, and that's another part of the research in the younger children. They're, there's much more elasticity in their brain at that age mm -hmm. for them to... Um, Go from one language <coughs> to the yeah. other language. Yeah. Ah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's another physical thing, exactly. not right. just cultural mm -hmm. or experiential. Yes. Um, I thought maybe we, we'd talk a little bit about your class, maybe just an overview. You know, we'd like to know what grade, how many students, just the basics and who does what in the languages. Second grade. <coughs> it's mm -hmm. second grade. Mm -hmm. Dual language Spanish. Dual language English. We can have up to 26 students in mm -hmm. the class. Are There's all... two separate groups. And are you in the same room? You... No, we have a connecting door. Oh, so mm -hmm. you're in separate rooms. Yes. I was going to say it would be like, I used to hear, they'd say Chinese education where they all talk out at once. I was going to say, how do you manage that? <laughs> separate rooms, connecting door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My room is where all the teaching and the learning goes on in Spanish. In Kim's room, all the teaching and the learning goes on in English. What I'm doing in my room, Kim is doing in her room. Oh, you're both doing science or you're both We're, doing yes. reading, mm -hmm. but just in, in the, the other language. Yeah. Right. But it switches through the course of the day. I don't. Well, we'll get into the more of you know yep. your actual scheduling in just a minute because I would like to know how the students were selected. It's open enrollment. Right. It's open enrollment, mm -hmm. yeah, but at registration, the um, second language learners who come into the Providence Public Schools District, they are administered a test, a language dominance test. So it's then that the children are determined, it's determined through that test if the child is Spanish language dominant or English language dominant. And what does that say? If it's English dominant person, child, what happens? They're, they're stronger in English and the Spanish language dominant student is stronger in Spanish. But then in the classroom, the way that that's, translates to the that's classroom, what I'm questioning, yeah. they're mixed. So oh, they we are. have a balance of okay. dual language, English so, and Spanish. So you don't just have English-speaking students in your room? No, and you have they all speak this. both English and Spanish. So one child might be in your room teaching in English, but some are more proficient in English, some are more... Right. And in your room, you'll have... And they help each other. Yes, that's mm -hmm. the point. That's exactly I'm so the glad point. you said yeah. that. It, all the students, just the majority of our students are native Spanish speakers. And that test just tells us if they're stronger in their native language or if they've already acquired enough English that they're stronger in English. You know, this is so good because when I was teaching the grades, in first, second grade is where I started and then went mm -hmm. to first and then became a reading specialist. However, I think sometimes teachers underestimate what children can do for one another. And there's a lot of research on that for reading education. Instead of the teacher in you know, the front of the classroom just lecturing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when children are interacting, you're smiling. So that's what mm -hmm. you do. Because that's what we live. Right. That's what you live. So the children are totally engaged. To totally. Yes. Not just listening. And you're looking to the children for that feedback mm -hmm. and for them to um, support become, each other. And they become the leaders of the classroom. So it's Isn't a student-centered classroom? Yes. Student-centered. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard that word for a while, but I love it. And we'll be mm -hmm. right back to find out how they do this with these children all mixed up together. Stay <laughs> with us. We'll be right back. Michael Adams? Here. Michael Adams? Here. Michael Adams? Students who miss 18 days of school in any grade risk falling behind and not graduating. Absences add up. Well, Robert Pignano and Kimberly Gibo, you have been so informative right from the grassroots, from your dual language classroom. Thank you. But you know, across our country, everybody is talking about testing. In fact, you know teachers have, are pulling out their hair for all the time it takes to practice the tests and the over-reliance on tests. But I do have to ask you about assessment. How do you test these children, assess them, and um, you know, what happens from there? Would you like to talk about that? Gladly, great question. Uh, <coughs> our students take the same tests that the rest of the elementary school students take in, uh, in the Providence Public Schools, the exact same tests. Uh, the difference being, um, they're also given in Spanish. Uh, in the dual language program, 
the interim assessment that we do. That's in Spanish, but it's also done in Spanish in the other um, schools that have yeah. bilingual classrooms. It's, yeah, so so they take it in English and in Spanish. Is yes, that true? which means that we create two different versions. Because oh. if they took the test with me one week in Spanish, then they went to Kim to take the same test. Mm -hmm. It's the same test. They would have had practice. Right. right. So we make sure. Which makes the score go up if you practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It would right. be equitable. Mm -hmm. Yes. And vice versa. So you have different but similar yes. content in yes. the testing. Mm -hmm. And how are they doing? Oh, they're doing very well. And, really? Um, historically, our access test is higher a bit higher than the district average for our access wow. test. Access test uh, tests the English proficiency, the English competencies, how they're grasping English. And it's not only at our school, it's district wide. And so your, your students are doing pretty well. Yes. They're doing very well, despite the fact that they spend half their day in Spanish. Yes, well. It adds to it. I did read some of the research that said part, well, you referred to it, parts of the brain yes. are stimulated when yes. you're learning two languages that it just doesn't happen when you're learning one. Yes. And I, I know you alluded to that earlier. So, so people who are so worried about, will my child pass the test? You're doing something different. You must hear that from parents. But um, the scores are doing okay. So let's go into your classroom and describe a typical day. Now remember, I'm going to catch you because I taught second grade years ago. <laughs> and I was progressive. I like what you say you do. So tell us about your day. What happens? Um, usually, Bob and I <coughs> go in for about an hour early every day to refine the day, depending upon which group we have and their needs. Um, we'll do planning for that day. In the morning, I'll start off with one group and I'll have them for reading and writing, and I'll be teaching them in English. Bob has the other group, and he teaches them reading and writing in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And you have appropriate materials. Your oh, materials yes. are very, all very in supportive. Mm -hmm. Espanol, and yours yes. in yes. English. The Providence Public Schools have been very supportive to our school. Well, they have a large population of Spanish-speaking right. mm -hmm. people, so right. again, as that rule said from the Supreme Court, they have to have equity. Equity, yeah. and also, you know, they said if the materials are the same, they can't understand it. So this is what you're doing, adjusting for mm -hmm. the language. Mm -hmm. All right, so now and you've planned. And then we switch. Right. Okay. So the morning has passed. <clears throat> we take the kids to lunch. And then the group that had been with me in the morning now goes to Kim, and the, vice versa. The, the group that had been with Kim comes to me. And that's when we do math and science. Okay. And that's on a five-day cycle, Nadja. Okay. So after that first five-day cycle, the group that had been doing um, literacy with Kim in the morning now comes to me for the second five-day cycle for literacy in Spanish. Oh. And I'll teach them for math and science and English. So, so every they, five days they get the opposite they get language. They the opposite mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. So you don't really have time to forget it. No, because you're no, constantly it's ongoing. Right. Both languages are constantly being in use. used. Mm -hmm. yes. And the other thing we do, Kim and I like to say that we challenge the boundaries of dual language. What does that mean? Well, challenge? what it means is that there's a separation of languages. My room is Spanish, her room is English, and that's all that's supposed to happen. But Kim and I put the groups together quite frequently. Now, what happens when you do that? It's magic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, magic? It's magic. Oh, it's I'm to get a camera down there and see oh, magic. Oh, the things that we get out of those kids when they're together and they're using both languages and the, 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 what wonderful? they say, what they share, and the way they speak to each other. It's so <clears> inspiring. <throat> we do a lot of bridging activities where we see, compare the two languages, how they are the same and how they are different. Bridging, what does that mean? You're going from one language to the other language. While you're teaching, how... while they're all conversing. Do well, they talk to each other? Oh, yes. Yeah. Good. Oh, my goodness. Mm. And they, they will say, you know, I agree with what you said, but I'd like to add. So, so they're doing some critical thinking. Yes. yes. They're not just parroting, learning vocabulary words. and Oh, no. You know, they're thinking in the languages. Mm -hmm. Is no, that correct? It, we're, like, facilitating. Uh-huh. Now, the other party or the other group of people who are involved, of course, are the parents. And I know I did read uh, some of the pros and cons that come from communities or parents. 
And I read that some communities see this as the structure of it. They think you're catering to people who are coming into their community. And you know these immigrants, are, they're afraid their children are going to Im, um, embrace the immigrants' culture. And one woman said, I send my son to school, but I don't want him to come. It's a Chinese and English dual language. Mm -hmm. I don't want him to come home thinking and being Chinese. And then you hear the other, another very vocal group is English only. Now, if you have parents who have those feelings, maybe you don't. So first of all, tell me your response from your parents, and then maybe how you can answer those who have these other feelings. Our parents are extremely supportive of the program, of the teachers, mm -hmm. of the students. You have a PTA? We or? have a PTA, very active PTA, and they're so wonderful with the teachers. Isn't that great? It's, mm -hmm. all, it's all very, very positive. I think we don't face what you just mentioned. I Like um, a native Spanish-speaking household coming to our school where and being immersed in Spanish, we really don't have that because we're not two-way immersion where you have native English speakers mixed with native Spanish speakers because the oh. majority of our students are, just about all of them, are native Spanish speakers who are learning English. Mm -hmm. So actually, the type of model we are under the dual language umbrella, we're a developmental bilingual model. So your parents don't object, most of them? Oh, no, no. because they love the fact that the children are maintaining and refining Spanish As well, and acquiring English. English. Mm -hmm. So it's additive. Yes. That, that's, I can see that, because that's what we used to do. The melting pot was you came from all over mm -hmm. the world, yeah. but you had to learn. Yeah. I had a brother-in-law who was brilliant. He's passed away now, but he came with his family from Italy, and um, he was put into a class with uh, children who had, we would say today, mental challenges, because he couldn't speak the language. And it wasn't, he kind of on his own had to learn it. By the time he got to the upper grades, he was fine. Mm -hmm. But what a, a terrible thing. A misplacement. Right. <coughs> Complete totally. misplacement, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the biggest challenges, of course, in education is funding. So I'll ask you, does the dual language program cost more than the regular schools? No. no. It doesn't? No. no. It doesn't in terms of having to buy extra books with well, different... Well, they're not extra because, say my class <coughs> were just English, they'd have to buy me the English books. They're just buying the same books, but in Spanish. I see. There is no extra mm -hmm. cost. There's no extra cost. No. And that's of course, a, they don't myth. pay teachers any, anything special. I mean, are you paid on a whole different uh, There's level? a very, I'll be honest, there's a very <coughs> slight stipend for okay. the bilingual teachers. Mm -hmm. Well, that's okay because I remember when they were short of math teachers and they offered quite a good bonus because they needed math teachers. So people who stepped mm -hmm. forward did get that. Mm -hmm. And then in special ed, we went through that for a few years right. where they mm -hmm. offered special bonuses to teachers who would come in and help. So um, <coughs> we're getting close to the end of the program, but yeah. I'm just wondering about um, your major frustrations or the feelings that you have Tell me about some of the accomplishments. I think when you called me, you were telling me about something you do with a store, which kind of represents oh, how store. your mm -hmm. students flow together and how the languages flow together. I'm not sure. I don't remember all of it. But if you could tell me about that, because I think that's an achievement, wouldn't you say? Was, it was marvelous. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, what was that all about? We were studying, counting money, um, oh. hundreds, tens, and ones, place value. So we had the students create a school store. They brought in oh. some pretend materials like empty cereal boxes, juice containers, and they put prices on the items. Mm -hmm. And the first graders <laughs> came to buy things from their school store, so we had a real life experience. No, were the first graders <laughs> from a dual language? From our mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. Oh, is your yes. entire school dual language? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I didn't get that. Oh, it's such a benefit because <coughs> before we were a, a, a dual language school unto itself, we were a program within a school. That's what I, I recognize. We're our own dual language school. It's, and, yeah. Well, that, that's, that's what, the way So when the be. first graders come, they're having the same experience of yes. dual yes. language. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So when they go to buy some spaghetti, they, the person selling it might be 
speaking in Spanish. Well, we, we, How does this work? We separated. We had three stores mm -hmm. on this side of the uh, cafeteria. That was the, those were the Spanish stores. The English stores were over here, and the children used the language of the store. And oh. they had to visit either. So they had you to visit an English and a Spanish. So if you mm -hmm. wanted that candy bar or whatever, you better know how to say it in both in languages, both languages. Right. <laughs> or you're out of luck. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, I know they were pretending, but mm -hmm. still, what a wonderful experience. So now, that, that shows an accomplishment that children can actually be engaged and use both languages. And we had but, a lot of parent <coughs> involvement, too, where the yeah. parents came in and they were supervising at each store. They were probably amazed. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I would mm -hmm. if it were my son coming home and he could say much more than I can in Spanish. I think for me, the, main, the biggest accomplishment we had at this particular school year was our children presented an academic presentation, the grade two students to the whole school. We're developing oh. in, the, in the district um, landmark units, landmarks. And they're an absolute wonderful means of the children participating actively, tangibly, in, um, in a study, in a certain study. And we took that landmark unit a step further by the children teaching all the other children Excellent. about that landmark, which was folklore. So I think if I were to say, are you frustrated or are you fill, filled with optimism? Well, we're filled, filled with, with optimism. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I somehow thought that would be your <laughs> On a answer. daily basis. Yeah. And good for you. The, no one, unless another teacher, would understand all the work that goes into preparing, executing, follow up. Thank you so much, Robert Pagnano. Oh, thank you. And Kimberly Jibo. Thank you. Thank you so much. And in closing, I'm just going to say that immersion programs are growing all over the country. So we will continue to cover that topic here on Charla Escola School Talk. Mm -hmm.